Andre Harrell, the founder of the legendary Uptown Records and a former president of Motown and Bad Boy Records, has recently joined Sean Combs' Revolt TV network. I talked to him about Revolt and its new music conference, his career, and his future. Welcome to you, Andre. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for having me here, bro. Yeah, recently named vice chairman of Revolt TV, which is the new music television network founded by Sean Combs. Correct. Uh, first, tell me the goal of this network, and then tell me about your role there. Our goal with the network is to be dedicated to music. We wanted to give new artists a place where they can get discovered. We wanted to be uh, not just a, uh, a cable network, but a media platform that utilized all the different social media aspects to promote artists, whether it be Instagram, whether it be Twitter, whether it be Vine, plus cable TV, plus have outside experiences. Okay, uh, so MTV isn't showing videos, but you guys do. Yes. Is that one of the things that really distinguishes you from a lot of the other networks? We, the thing that distinguishes us, we are our sports center of music meaning that's all we do and that's all we talk about music records artists their lifestyle their hits their ups their downs the new releases uh the concerts we cover concerts we cover festivals anything to do with music almost like the weather channel right if you want to know about whether you go to weather channel you want to know about music you come to revolt tv and this is a comcast partnership that diddy did this is the comcast okay. partnership but we're also carrying on time one as well okay so you're doing a music conference in miami i wanted you to come in because i feel that south by southwest and mm -hmm. the ultra music festival this is a very lucrative area mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, what I it looks like is you're building a blueprint for this to be like those except in your own special way mm -hmm. but to also have it be lucrative and have people learn a lot from those conferences now the difference between those they're festivals mm -hmm. South by Southwest is a festival this is a conference this is more business of music business and this is where the thing that we we're doing is we're creating a merge of technology social media, music executives, and brands, all in the same room. So young artists, young entrepreneurs, young managers could come and be in the room with the decision makers and understand what the brands are looking for, understand how to monetize their social media, understand how to use the new disruptors of the music business, Spotify, Pandora, in terms of, of subscription-based mm -hmm. music companies. and. Um, really figure out the future of the music business because it's a different game now. Like record companies aren't what they used to be in terms of the end all be all to promote your record. Now, when a record comes out, it comes out as a top 10 record. And that's because from, from SoundCloud to iCloud to Spotify to Beats uh, to Pandora, the music or Facebook has already been shared and people already had their opinions about it, and they already know that's a hit. Mm -hmm. So by the time radio goes on it, they're not as early as they used to be. So by the time they come on it, as soon as they play it, the phone just starts ringing because everybody already knows it. And is that good for independent artists? Like, well, it worked for Macklemore, right? They they were able it to totally do it. It totally worked for Macklemore. It gives, it gives independent artists who have good music a, a more even chance than before when it was about marketing dollars at the big record companies. Now if you have a great record and you put it on these platforms, people, people use these platforms as their own personal currency of integrity. Mm -hmm. So if I know something's great, I want to share it because it lets you know that I'm on top of it. Right, I'm co-signing. I'm co-signing it, I, I have good taste and I want to share it with you. And people use that currency to build their profile, to build their artist, to build their marketing. So it's a new game and, and we need to learn how to play it better. And that's why I put this conference together so we can really sit down and talk to the technology people to see what they say is really going on. Because 60% of the music is consumed on YouTube. Right, right. You knew that. Yeah. 
Okay. 60%. And, well, well, you know, and, and I've always wondered this because YouTube, for instance, you can just rip an MP3 off of YouTube if you like a song. Mm -hmm. um, but YouTube never really, I mean, they're infringing on copyright to some extent or mm -hmm. not? No, so, no, they are. So why doesn't the industry go after them? I'm sure what happened is the smart people of technology were a little smarter than the record companies when they came out and made these, these businesses. So once these businesses got up and running, nobody wanted to turn them, turn them off because it's such a great way to get exposure and artists didn't turn it off because they got a different revenue stream. Hmm. No, they didn't get the same kind of mechanical royalty from big record sales because people are sharing music for free, but the concerts have went up three and four times. Mm -hmm. in terms of how much they tour, how much they're able to make. If you have one hit album, like right now, Kendrick Lamar with one hit album, his price quote is $150,000 hmm. with one hit album. When I was a kid, if you had one hit album, your price quote would be 5000 hmm. Well, let, let, let's go back because, <laughs> you know, you got Andre Harrell sitting here, and he founded Uptown Records. He served as president of Motown and Bad Boy Records. You've had a lot of success mm -hmm. in the music industry over the years. Your time at Motown had some bumps, but you've had a lot more success mm -hmm. than you've had struggles. What I really like about you is that you're one of the few executives that has had a hit every decade since the 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Most recently with Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines. That's the biggest record I've ever had. And you were executive producer of that. You've never spoken about that. That was a powerful moment in music. Well, me and Pharrell have been talking about disco music and the return of disco music as opposed to necessarily EDM. And we were saying that EDM didn't have the same kind of soul. And uh, we, both, uh, we, we both appreciate church and soul music. So disco originally in the 70s had soul singers on it. Right. Whether it be Donna Ross, whether it be Donna Summers, uh, they could they could all sing backgrounds like church backgrounds. So now when he came with um, the Robin Thicke Blood line, it was directly from our conversation. As a matter of fact, I had called Robin when he was making the album, and I said, "You should go see Pharrell right now because Pharrell is on the right groove right now." Right, and he wasn't. He was your artist, a lot, yes. Robin Thicke. So yes. a lot of people don't know that. That you managed I signed, to... I signed him to New America Music. Uh, you were, what, mid-30s when you were at Motown? Yeah, I was, 30, I was 34 years old. Okay. So you obviously have an eye for talent. Mm -hmm. You're able to spot. What is it that makes a star? When, when you see someone, how do you distinguish one from well, someone else? What, what makes a star one is their voice. And I don't mean their speaking voice. I mean their point of view of what they're talking about. I tend to lean toward people who talk about things that are culturally significant in our universe at that time. So when you talk about things that are cultural, like in Mary J. Art. Blige. You mean in their music? In their music, okay. like Mary J. Blige. She, she became queen of hip hop soul. What was cultural about her was one, she was the first one really singing hit records over hip hop. She was the first one dressing in hockey jersey, tennis skirts, and combat boots, dancing the way she danced, singing about real love with that pain in her voice that she was searching for real love. She, she came from the generation uh, that, that some parents uh, or, or older brothers or sisters were addicted to crack, so there was a lot of trouble in our community, and a lot of young people grew up around that trouble. So the normal family situation wasn't what it was. Mm -hmm. So I knew that if I worked with her, because she had a great voice, and you could hear the blues and the pain in her voice, and she was so real that I knew if I could work with her and, and help her be a success, I would be helping a whole generation of women be successful and have hope. You weren't the only person who became rich in mm -hmm. the mid-90s. There were a lot of young black millionaires that came out of that generation. Mm -hmm. You were a pioneer. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this era, do you see equal numbers of young black men uh, becoming music millionaires in the music industry as you did back then? No. And one of the reasons for that is that 
the music business selling records is declining. The people that are becoming billionaires are in the technology part of the music. Mm -hmm. And that, that hasn't yet been black people yet. Like Dre is the first black billionaire right. based on technology right. and music. Okay. So and I so think so I think now that that um, that has happened, he's inspiring more people to look toward that space because that space is where the real money is now. Mm -hmm. And when you see um, the 360 marketing model mm -hmm. in the music industry, which is a big part of your conference, mm -hmm. how can independent artists capitalize on companies and be, if they're not big enough to really offer these companies a uh, huge mass mm -hmm. because they're not known, how can they still forge relationships with well, companies? Well, it never starts out with, with an artist being huge. It starts out with an artist being influential. So he has to first get the influencers interested in him. And from that, and you get the influence interested in you now through social media. Right. You can put your record out on Twitter, you can put your record yeah. on SoundCloud, Spotify. And, and young people have a very lean forward approach to discovering, to discovering music. So as the music is discovered, uh, and you brought up somebody earlier who, who who is an independent artist who went all the way number one. What is this? Oh, Macklemore. Macklemore. Right. He started as an independent artist. Yeah. Got a big social media following. Yeah. Got a big touring following. His social media turned into people actually showing up to the concerts, turning into actually selling records and making videos and winning all these accolades. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, but it's not an overnight thing. Like music, just like any other career, is a journey, and you have to have talent, and you have to appreciate the journey. If you don't appreciate the journey, if you start out in music and your only thing is, I want to get rich, that's not the right reason. Right. The right reason is that you have something you want to say. Will the music industry ever get its revenues from music sales back, or is that over? I mean, is, is music great? I think this conference, the Revolt Music Conference down in Miami at the Fountain Blue, October 16th to 19th, we have a disruptors panel. And the reason we call it disruptors is because Spotify, Pandora, Beats, all these different um, subscription-based music companies have basically taken away from having to go and buy records. You can hear records a lot for free. Yeah. So it takes away from the old model of getting your record royalty. So now we're, we're going to have conversations to really get dig deep into that to understand where is that money going? Mm -hmm. And how much is that money? And how much of that money makes it from the record company, the publisher, back to the writer, and the actual artists? You, you have a strong background in marketing. You've, mm -hmm. you've run an advertising agency, New America. Mm -hmm. uh, you've also advised on the marketing of Sean John and Ciroc and Revolt. Mm -hmm. um, what is the key to launching a successful new brand? Uh, I would say the most important thing is to find a niche. Find your niche, whether it be Hispanic, black, uh, country, you find the underserved marketplace and you serve it. All right. Spoken by a true pioneer in this industry. Thank you so much, Andre Harrell. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. And with Andre Harrell, I'm Lee Hawkins. We'll see you next time.